Do you know what's in your smart device or how reliable it is? Probably not, and that's all right. That's one of the reasons for this channel, to take you on a tour of these devices and what they're made of. And when I'm not doing that, I'll show you how to build those same devices yourself, you know, if you want to. Anyway, this Shelly motion sensor isn't going to take itself apart and just tell us all its secrets. That's my job. Welcome to Smarter Circuits. I'm your host, Ian Klein. Smart motion sensors aren't a new thing, and this Shelly motion sensor isn't even their first version, let alone the only version out there. There are hundreds of these things. I'm going to take this one apart to show you how it works, which will more or less apply to most of the smart sensors available on the market today. Remember, I'm not only going through this to show you how to understand this, I'll be doing a follow-up in the next video where I build a similar or better device, more than likely better. I have unedited video of the dissection of this device available to patrons, which I'll be doing a lot more of if you're into that sort of thing. So please consider supporting the channel by becoming a patron. I go through quite a few devices and components after all. This is the inside of the Shelly Motion 1. When I get a Motion 2, I'll do a teardown and side-by-side -side comparison to see what hardware improvements they've made. It is quite different looking. There are two elephants in this living room, and I'm going to ignore both of them and talk about the battery. It's pretty much what you might expect, two 18650 cells in the back. I can tell you that this sensor came from my deck and will return there when I'm done. It's in the heat, the cold, and the wet. It gets dozens or more triggers a day, and this module, which is almost two years old, lasts over a month and a half at least between charges. I'll get to what makes that possible shortly. Here under this gob of glue that seems to be there for no particular component, we see the charge regulating circuitry for maintaining the cell when the USB is plugged in. I don't think the data pins are actually used, at least I haven't tried them, but there are other points to access the logic circuits that I won't cover in this video. I might do a series on that sort of depth later on. If you'd like that, let me know in the comments. Over here, you can see a little flat sensor. That's the accelerometer. That's how this little guy knows when it's being jostled and why the lights are flashing as I inspect it. There's no easy way to turn off the device, save for pulling a battery wire, and you still have to have it out to do that, so I played with it while it was active, and it had a fit about that. There's a smaller, less than exciting sensor right here, and that's the temperature sensor. This device only senses temperature, not humidity, which is a little bit of a bummer, but I already had temperature and humidity sensors before I bought these, so having the extra temperature sensor is more of a bonus than a necessity anyway. Here is a little 16 megabyte SPI flash memory module. This stores the program instructions the device uses, but I'll talk a little bit more about that in a few moments when I get to elephant number two. Jumping down here next to elephant number one is probably my favorite thing on this whole board because it's nifty. It's super useful, super sciency, and I think it looks rather striking. That is the photoelectric sensor that allows this unit to measure light levels. Isn't it neat? The short version is that when photons hit the dielectric that the electrodes are suspended in, it lowers the resistance and allows more current to pass through it. If you know how much resistance changes by how much light changes, you can use that to measure how much light strikes the sensor. Okay, elephant number one. This other really cool looking thing here. This is the PIR, or Passive Infrared Sensor. This thing is even more astounding than you know. The way this one works is by having a bunch of little pairs of pyroelectric sensors in it a pair per detection area, which I'll talk about in a minute. A pyroelectric sensor is a heat-sensitive film suspended in nitrogen that picks up minute infrared waves. If it emits heat, the pyroelectric sensor can sense it. The reason that they are used in pairs is that you don't just want to detect heat. You wouldn't know what to detect in any given house or any given weather. You need to see localized changes in heat. So, if one of the tiny sensors picks up more heat than the other being so close to it, the detector sees that as the movement of a mammal. The reason the lens is divided up into sections like this is so that you can do some tricks by sensing a lot of smaller areas all at once and comparing the results to gauge whether said mammal is a human or a cat. If you are worried about lizard people, I'm afraid you'll need to purchase a dual sensor that also incorporates a microwave proximity sensor as a redundant means of motion detection. And you can, those are pretty common. 
There are many types of motion detectors. The passive infrared and microwave proximity are the most common, but there are also ultrasonic proximity, camera-based of course, vibration sensors or shock sensors, active infrared which send out infrared light instead of just detecting it, and tomographic, which I'll talk about in great detail in the next video when I build a device to emulate this one. So now you know how this device gets all of its information. It has a temperature sensor, an accelerometer, a photoelectric sensor, a passive infrared sensor, and it has some memory here. But what about processing and a kernel of some kind? After all, it has a web server with an interface and does all kinds of timery stuff. Well, that of course brings us to elephant number two. This big, relatively, silver thing. This threw me off at first. When I opened this device, I thought this was the system on chip. Then I looked up the base model without revision and discovered that it's a Wi-Fi module. I was puzzled by the lack of any kind of microcontroller or processor, but then I went back and searched the entire model and discovered that there is a Cortex M4 72 MHz ARM processor in here. It has 512K of RAM and 2 MB of flash memory on board, which is why they wanted the extra 16 MB. They probably needed a little more, and you can save scripts on this device, something I'll cover in a video in the future perhaps. So there it is. I'm a little shocked by the underwhelming ARM processor, especially since the Shelly Pro 4 runs a 196 MHz processor, but I suppose they don't really need much, and everything on this board is specifically engineered to be low power, the reason the one on my deck lasts so long. The one here under my kitchen cabinets only gets use when we wave a hand underneath to turn them on, so it's gone three months now without charging, which is how long it's been installed under there. I'm trying to improve the channel with each video, and I hope you'll join me in the next one as I try to build a device to do all the things this device can and more. In fact, I'll be talking about tomography a little bit and playing with lasers of all kinds, so be sure to join me for that. I do hope you enjoyed the video, and of course if you did enjoy it and haven't already done so, please do subscribe to the channel. If you want to know what's going on between episodes, you can follow Smarter Circuits on Twitter at CircuitSmarter or on Facebook. And if you'd like to help make more and better videos possible, consider becoming a patron on our Patreon page linked below. Thanks for listening to me ramble, and I do hope you'll join me for future videos as I continue exploring smarter circuits.